Welcome, everyone, and welcome to the IBME UVU show, where we discuss leadership and success stories. I'm your host, Antoine Valentin, and today we're joined by our guest, Professor Tom McCluskey. Tom is a higher education practitioner and leadership coach working on, with organizational consulting, specializing in virtual workplace competencies and organizational effectiveness. Tom has worked with corporate higher education, athletic, and nonprofit organizations for many years. Throughout his career, Tom has had several higher education roles at notable institutions, including UCLA, Pepperdine, and UC Irvine. Tom also enjoyed a long career in publishing, including over five years at a and Television Networks for Biography Magazine. Don earned a bachelor's degree in broadcast journalism and English at University of Southern California and holds a master's degree in management and leadership from Pepperdine University. So with that, welcome, Professor. Did I leave anything out? No, sir, Antoine, you got it. Uh, you, you got only the good stuff, which is good. I'd like to keep the bad stuff out of there. <laughs> okay, great, great. Well, super grateful that um, you you uh, found the time to meet with me. I know you're super busy with the various things that you're working on. And uh, uh, I'm excited to talk to you today and just learn about your leadership journey as well as your personal success story. Um, so what I thought I'd start is just get a sense of, um, from a leadership perspective, again, I know you've been working consulting for a while and you've been coaching and mentoring, uh, again, individuals and teams. Can you just give me a sense of where you're at now from a leadership perspective, how you sort of see it, contrast that to years ago when you first started? Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a big difference. Great question. Um, for now, I look at my leadership role, if you will, whether it's in the classroom or with my clients, is to provide best practices, to really look at their individual environments, if you will, their needs, and say, what are some of the best practices that I can share in terms of uh, academically and professionally, you know, from, from the theories and then the practice, uh, deriving information from the research articles and books that I've read and use, and my own personal experience and the experiences of others to say, this is what worked, this is what didn't. So I'd say now I'm more of a best practices consultant, someone uh, listening to concier concierge, if you will, to, uh, to use the Sicilian term, uh, on how do we get better? How do I achieve my goals? What is out there? What do I need to know? Far different from the leadership role that I had in publishing. It was a young person's industry when there was a publishing industry. Um, and we, uh, you know, it was really about how much money are you making right here, right now? What are you doing? Um, and the leadership was really, style was really driving revenue, if you will. And there wasn't really a long period of time to get into personal development, though I did try to do that. I tried to uh, have a personal uh, approach, but I was younger at the time. And I look back and I, I see, especially when I was in the MSNL curriculum, I look back on what did I do right? And what did I do wrong? Because I had a long rearview mirror by which to uh, to look at. And there were some things I, I did right and some things I would like to uh, to do differently. I think it was more transactional at the time. And that was based on what the industry was expecting of its leaders and you know while i tried to have a personal touch there was still that overall arc of are we making our numbers and let's get it done like yesterday so i think now i've got a little bit more because i'm in higher academics not only do i have a chance to step back and look at at uh, big picture stuff also there's a maturity level to that too how do we really motivate people uh in the long term it's not like i didn't do that in my previous leadership document and i do have former employees that stay in touch with me but i look back and say boy i would have loved to have uh done some things differently some things were good but some things also differently and i wonder if that was a question of me needing to grow as a person uh the industry requiring me to be a lot more hardcore or a mix of both i see so uh, you bring up some interesting points that I wanted to learn more about. Was that transition from the publishing career that you had where you went into higher education and uh, ultimately, again, now working as a consultant, helping other leaders and organizations. So 
Um, talk to me about the timing and sort of the motivation again. So you you got your master's in management and leadership um, at Pepperdine, which is of course where where you and I met because I also got my master's in management and leadership, and you were one of my professors. Um, so talk to me about the timing of when you went for your uh, master's, and were you still doing publishing, or did you already make like a conscious decision you wanted to transition? Can you help me understand that better? Of course, uh, and it was a little bit of both. There was a conscious decision on my part, and it was the industry's decision for not only me but a lot of people. Uh, you know, today when I look on LinkedIn and see, oh, what are my former publishing colleagues or uh, ad agency heads? What are they doing now? Most of us are doing something differently, and this is my something different. And what really happened was I was devoted to the publishing industry. I had put a lot of hours, a lot of time into it. I had some success. I'll be honest. You know, my teams. Mm -hmm. outperformed the industry in terms of uh, revenue increases. And I was proud about that because I wasn't your typical beat em up publisher. You know, I inspired them and I could be tough at times, but more personal than, than tough. Uh, but, and so I was in it for the long haul, but the industry folded and mm -hmm. it's not nearly what it was uh, in the past today. And even then back in uh, 2009, when I started making the transition, you know, I was looking uh, what am I going to do? And I was with a smaller media publishing company at the time, and we were sold to a bigger company, and they weren't taking me along. And I was okay with that because I wasn't sure I was going to go. And so it was a transition that I somewhat initiated, but somewhat was forced on me. I was dating a woman that is now my wife. She had a tenured uh, job in California. I'd always wanted to get back here. And so I made the decision to move. Mm -hmm. And then there was a big what now, because this was during the time of the Great Recession uh, in 2009, and there were not a lot of job openings, and it took years. It took till like 2014 for the job market to uh, to get back to where it was before that uh, mortgage meltdown. Yeah. And it was a tough time to figure out, well, what am I going to do? But I looked at... Um, you know, where I go from here, I realized that I wasn't really going to get any publishing jobs uh, in Southern California as a colleague of mine who had then turned into a recruiter said, you know, you have too much horsepower for out here and they're not going to want to hire you because they think you're going to leave the minute something better comes. And I thought about it. I'm like, yeah, they're probably right. But it wasn't really my passion anyway. I saw that the industry was collapsing, but it was, what do I do now? And I had found the Small Business Development Center network and I got hired as a consultant, a business advisor, where I met um, a lot, worked with a lot of entrepreneurs and small business uh, owners on best business practices. At that same time, I found out about the MSNL program. And it was something I was really excited about. I didn't, nothing against MBA. I love it. I teach a lot of MBA students, love them. But I'd had enough business experience with the finance and, and everything like that. But this was a topic that was always a passion line. So I said, I'll, I'll go and, and check it out. And I was just so enthralled with it at the orientation session that I decided to enroll. And so I was a full-time student while I was a business advisor. But still, I was thinking, you know, what now? What now? I wanted to get into a leadership position, but my industry really had collapsed and people didn't look at my overall uh, executive leadership experience as much as the fact that, well, you were in the magazine industry and we're a different industry. So that was an adjustment for me mm -hmm. to, to make. But one thing led to another and I took advantages here. Someone said, hey, would you like to teach this course? Would you like to teach that course? And, you know, would you like to... Mm -hmm you know, be a business advisor here or can you help our company? So I just took what was in front of me and fast forward to here. Now I'm a full-time practitioner faculty at Pepperdine and I teach part-time at UCLA. I don't work with the SBDC anymore because once I got full-time at Pepperdine, I was like, I'm not going to give you what you've come to expect of me. And I can't live with myself if, uh, at that. I want to leave while you still like me. So, uh, so I did, but I, I have over the course of this journey, developed uh, consulting uh, prospects and clients. So mm -hmm. that was my journey. It wasn't really, I didn't carve out a path and say, this is my end goal and this is how I'm going to get there. Life presented me with the path and I took the opportunities that I thought um, were the best and, and for better, or for worse, uh, more often than not, it worked out. Yeah, it, it seems like it did. And uh, you said so much that resonated for me, especially 
uh, your reasons for choosing an MSML over an MBA. Frankly, I shared that same passion specifically for leadership, which is why I made the same choice. Um, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm glad that's something we have in common. Um, uh, talk to me about your that experience, and I know there was a lot of takeaways for me going through the MSML program. Can you think about maybe the one or two things that really stand out from your personal experience when you went through the coursework uh, at the end versus from when you started? Oh, yes, yeah, so much of it. And I had a benefit. Uh, you know, First off, I was a little bit nervous about two things that didn't come to pass. You know, I was going to be one of the older students in the classes, so would I fit in? And secondly, I was a journalism student as an undergrad, and it was hammered into us, thou shalt not plagiarize. And they even had a rule that if you're even accused of plagiarism, you don't even get a chance to appeal. You're out. You're expelled from the school. And I knew that there were so many different uh, electronic forms of analyzing coursework that I could, what if I plagiarize myself unwittingly? So I was nervous about that and I was nervous about fitting in. Neither one happened. The benefits that I thought I would have, which turned out was I could look in the rearview mirror of my career because I'd had a long career before I went to school and look at the academic information that we were studying and relate that to what I went through and good and bad. And, and some of it was, uh, you know, good lessons. Wow, I actually did this right. Or, um, Boy, what was I thinking at the time? But the one that stuck with me the most was when we were studying change management. And um, we used the textbook, uh, The Heart of Change by, uh, by, by Daniel Cotter and Richard Cohen. And they have eight steps to affecting organizational change. And I looked at that and I said, oh my God, I didn't even know this book existed mm -hmm. when, I, when we took these exact steps at my last media. Mm -hmm job at Conceive Media. And the first was um, establish a sense of urgency. You know, it's not about the data, it's about we need to do this. And I had to convince the CEO that we cannot be a publishing entity solely. We have to be on the internet. We have to, at the time there was internet radio, we have to have a greater social media presence. We have to invest our money there. And it's, it's a no brainer now, but this was back in uh, 2007, you know, it wasn't as established yet, but I knew that and we ultimately did it and we went from losing a ton of money to eking out a, uh, a, a reasonable profit in about 14 months. So when we studied that, the light bulb went off and I was like, oh my God, we did this right. Uh, that's something that I'll always uh, look back on fondly, the lesson that shined a positive light on what uh, I and my team had done in my last media job. Yeah, so I bet that was validating for you because you were, when you lived through it in real time at the publishing company, it was organic and it was a result of um, necessity. It sounds like you saw an opportunity, you helped communicate the need for change and you helped implement it. And then later in the MSML journey where you experienced um, that sort of validation from the coursework, that probably felt really, really good, right? Oh, uh, really good. And I just remember talking to the editor uh, saying, I want to do this. And I thought about it. I was like, well, if she and her team aren't on board with this, it's, not, it, it's a non-starter because you know, they're going to create the content. And I told her what I wanted to do and talked to the CEO. And she just sighed. She goes, Tom, I've been trying to get her to do this for years. And she won't do it. And she bites my head off sometimes. I'm like, wow, and she loves you and she'll still bite your head off. So I said, okay, that's good information. So what I can promise you is the effort. I cannot promise you the results given what you've told me, but I can promise you an effort. And what was really validating is again, I didn't say, hmm, I think I'm going to pull this out of my quiver and use the eight steps to uh, the heart of change. I just went with what I thought was right. And I appealed to, uh, to the CEO about the fact that her dream of being a preeminent media mm -hmm. in this area would die if we didn't do this. Mm -hmm. And so she finally uh, got it. Um, so yeah, it was very self validating. It's like, because. Mm -hmm. Any good, any poker player will always tell you, you don't really remember your big wins. You always remember your bad beats. Mm -hmm. And so I remember my bad beats, but this was a big win. So I really enjoy focusing on that and say, yeah, I got some things right. It was really validating. Um, yeah. Not just because I finally sold the idea, but because everybody was so enthusiastic when we pulled it off. It was great to see the team pull together. That was really validating. That's a great story. Now you mentioned change management specifically, and I'm just wondering, there's many sort of disciplines that fall under the leadership umbrella. Would you say um, change management is maybe one of your 
uh, areas of expertise or, or are there is there another one that maybe you're you're more passionate and experienced about uh, you know what you know what's interesting antoine is yes i teach change management and i realize how important it is to get it right because it's a natural human emotion to fear change you know it's uh we're basically psychologically wired to try to make order out of chaos and change brings chaos real or imagined and so we have to fight through the reaction the emotional reaction to avoid it but that's one of the worst things that we could ever do so i look at that and i'm passionate about overcoming that in myself too you know look i, I know it's true but i still go through that i you know I'm, I'm still a human being and, and everybody does so that's a big passion of mine uh another big passion of mine is teaching about and researching leadership in the virtual world. Uh, I was actually, uh, I convinced the folks at Pepperdine to, that we should have a class devoted to that. And they said, okay, write it up. And I did, and, and it was interesting. It was one of those things where I said, well, you know, given the process, it might take about 18 months for it to get there. So yeah, I know things move, uh, the wheels grind slowly in higher um, education, but the situation turned out that they needed an elective. And so really six months later, I was teaching this class. Oh, wow. so, uh, so I'm, I'm really passionate about it. Uh, leadership, uh, virtual leadership was the first subject I spoke about at a education conference. So it's that, and then, um, you know, basic team management and, and employee motivation. So all of those, which are critical to, uh, to leadership acumen, yeah. I feel fortunate that they've asked me to teach and I get passionate about it. That's great. And your passion definitely shines through um, in your lectures. Um, so let's talk about that the virtual leadership. And um, obviously with technology now, managing virtual teams is becoming more and more prevalent, especially with COVID, I think accelerated um, the need. There has been a push recently for um, folks returning to the office, but I think for sure, remote um, employees and teams will, will be something that continues uh, with us here for the future. So can you talk about maybe some of the um, best practices or tips that uh, you're teaching managers when it comes to virtual teams? Yeah, absolutely. What a great question, because there's so much about it. First is to understand that the virtual marketplace, if you will, and what you need as a leader is is not going away and there's a couple reasons for that because of the global economy and the proliferation of preferred trade agreements we're in a global economy that means that you're going to have influence throughout the country but you cannot set up um you cannot set up uh, offices everywhere nobody has the infrastructure but the virtual world allows you to have real good uh strong acumen at a fraction of uh, of the cost so it's here to stay the you know the global economy begets virtual competency uh technology advances allow for the global economy to work so that toothpaste isn't going back in the tube so i think that's the first thing that we have to realize especially honestly older managers because they weren't or, and leaders they weren't used to that and so the reason uh, that you mentioned 100 percent right that there's kind of a pushback of going back into uh, the office mm -hmm. Some of it is by necessity. There are some specific jobs where, yes, the people need to be there uh, so they can work more effectively together. Uh, software designers and engineers are a good example. They need to be there uh, on, on site at least a couple times a week so that they can work together on the new software. Mm -hmm. But it's the fear factor of, well, everybody needs to be here that I have to uh, check up on that. And I think that we have to realize that it's not going anywhere and we can't be scared of it. And so we have to utilize it. And plus, if you wanna draw the best employees, they're going to want at the very least a hybrid schedule, if not a fully remote schedule. So if you want the best people on your team, you gotta give them what they want in this regard. And so we have to make it appetizing to work for our organizations. And as a leader, there is a lot more that is required of a virtual leader than Mm -hmm. not ground leader because you know you, you run into your people organically in the hallway or whatever uh in the lobby of the building you don't have that with virtual you have to make that personal connection happen and usually it's via a video conference like this and so you're seeing somebody on a small square screen it can be really impersonal if you let it be and so you really have to reach out and make those personal connections find out how uh how people are doing and realize that 
we have to contact these people as you know as often as appropriate because the number one thing that turns a really high producing virtual employee into a medium level producing is the sense of isolation I don't know what I need. I, I don't talk to my manager. What am I doing? Am I doing it right? We are social beings. We need that contact. And virtual does not mean inhuman. It means we have to initiate that contact to uh, to keep communication lines open and to maintain relationships with our employees and motivate them to want to exceed. That's Those are probably the, the critical elements that I tell people of effective virtual leadership. Don't be scared of it know that it's here to stay, realize that your virtual does not mean impersonal. So make the extra effort to uh, get to know them personally and motivate them personally. You made a lot of interesting points there. And something that stood out I wanted to double click on was you mentioned that in some cases, uh, the need to have employees return to the office stems from a manager who doesn't feel secure uh, uh, in uh, the absence of an in-person sort of oversight of their team. So um, if, if I heard that right, talk to me a little bit more about that. When you're coaching and consulting managers maybe that are struggling, how do you help them address that, that need for, again, uh, the, the security of knowing that they're seeing their team in person to confirm that they're working? Because it's really, it sounds like a deficiency on their part as opposed to the need for the teams to actually come to an office. Yeah, for the most part it is. I mean, sometimes not everybody gets the hiring right. You know, somebody interviews really well and then, you know, they don't do the job. And when it's completely virtual, people like that can hide. And so there's a real uh, challenge to that. And I don't mean to demean it and always put it on the manager, but for a large, to a large degree, it is uh, the uh, managers that are used to uh, things a certain way and they don't get out of their old methodology and so what i do on a big picture is talk about this is why it is it just uh, why you need this for all the instances that we talked about that it's what top level employees want it's how organizations best operate and that you know we have to i i try to pitch it into what's in it for you to do this what first and why should you do this not just to be mr nice gal or mr nice guy you know i mean the whole thing about leading and managing isn't you know to make everybody happy it's to inspire them it's to lead them to increase productivity but positive leadership skills in my mind get you there faster and there's research that bears that out so when i try to get them comfortable with leadership uh, virtual leadership acumen, I phrase, I frame it in, what's in it for you? Well, you know, you become a better leader, recognized within your organization if you pulled this off. It might also help you in your hiring practices because that's a real threat. You know, you want to get the right people that aren't going to uh, hide. So maybe it helps you discern in the interview process who's really going to be up to the challenge. It gives you an extra skill set and it makes your team more productive when you do get the right hires in there so there's a lot of positives to it and not really very many neg negatives to it other than if you make a hiring mistake but that can happen in a traditional workplace too mm -hmm. you know you you said uh, something stood out at me i identified a theme in, the, in a couple of the examples that you gave today um where you're taking the interests of the other person and making them uh, your priority. So, for example, in the story uh, you just gave, you mentioned what's in it for them and, and, and creating some awareness around that. And then in the previous story where you shared with your publisher and the change management, you touched on her uh, future that she had envisioned for herself and you used those emotions to help get the point across. So I think that's a really good sort of technique and strategy as far as whenever we communicate with with anyone regardless of the topic always try to put ourselves in their shoes and think about how how they uh, would benefit from the situation is that right yeah 100 percent. i teach a lot of different courses um i teach a lot of uh, business and organizational communication courses and uh, 
and um, I teach a uh, statistical communication course at uh, UCLA. And I and all of these, I say, if you take just one thing away from any of this, it's analyze your audience, know your audience, know what their goals are, know how much they know about the subject. You know how detailed or uh, or rudimentary do you need to do in your uh, communication practices, and are they positively inclined towards what you're telling them? Are they neutral? Will they be negatively inclined? That impacts how you uh, share your message. But think about them. What are they going to alight to? And what are their needs? You know, you don't want to go in and say, oh, we're A, B, and C. Oh, that's great, but we need D, E, and F. If you analyze beforehand, you looked at they need D, E, and F. How does this fit into what they need? Mm -hmm. Well, it requires uh, emotional or um, intelligence, I think, to uh, be able to think in that way. Normally, I know um, sometimes it's easy to think about your own needs and your own interests and not so much about the other person. So I think it's it's actually a skill that's acquired over time and help uh, definitely makes um, collaboration and communication easier when we can do that, put ourselves in others' shoes. Um, going back to the uh, virtual teams, Talk a little bit about some of the other challenges are related to uh, different geographic time zones as well as cultures and the impact those have on uh, virtual teams. Any thoughts uh, or best practices you want to share there with leaders that are managing teams that are um, maybe in different parts of the world? Or oh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it manifests itself not only in different parts of the world, but also in different parts of the country that one finds themselves in. There is a lot of regional differences. No matter what the country, you're going to see different regions and different uh, mores of what that region says is the correct way to conduct business with your counterparts. So we have to think about that. We have to realize that not everybody is like us. They don't think like us all the time. We have to think about what's important to them. Still, with the overall arching goal of we got to get to point A from this point B, and that's what we're uh, challenged to do. But to really think about what um, what are their cultural nuances, how do they work given their uh, their culture, and choose the correct medium by which to communicate. A lot of people hide behind email. Well, they're they're far away and and you know I can't really do that. And it's safe to email somebody rather than pick up the phone or do what you and I are doing because oh boy, what if they they call me out on something. But that the richer the media and in person is the most rich media you could have the richer the media the greater chance to unearth and um overcome conflicts or potential conflicts and the less chance for misunderstanding uh when you look at email it can really come from three it could come with three tones positive neutral or negative and studies have shown that the recipient takes the tone differently than the sender. If the sender believes it's a positive email, the um, recipient takes it as neutral. If the sender believes it's neutral, the recipient takes it as negative. And I actually had a, a, uh, an instance with a uh, student of mine in an organizational communication class that I taught who worked here in California and she talked to me after questions. I'm having issues with this guy in Boston. You know, I don't think he respects me. He's very curt and you know, I don't feel like I'm getting what he needs. I don't think he respects me. And, uh, you know, because I can just tell that in his emails, he's very short and everything. I said, well, did you call him? And she said, no, I don't do that. I said, well, you just might want to because email leaves a lot of room for misinterpretation. So call him. She said, well, I don't know. I said, well, you're going to be glad you did. It may work out exactly how you uh, how you think, but then you'll at least know. You won't be guessing. Or he could surprise you. So she talks to me the next day at class, she goes, okay, I did it. Or the next week at class, goes, okay, I did it. And you know what? I'm so glad I did. I talked to him and I aired out my yeah. you know, concerns. And he goes, oh, no, that's not it at all. You know, I, I'm getting what I need from you and I respect you and I appreciate what you're doing. I'm just very short in my emails because that's the way I communicate and I'm real busy. And I figured you're real busy. So I didn't want to waste your time. She goes, so we're good. And I said, yeah, there's a regional difference. He's in Boston. He's an East Coast guy. He's going to be real cut to the chase. We're less so here out West. And we can take that as being uh, brusque and that's not it. So when it comes to a virtual workplace, Sometimes we do have to get out, even though 
our electronic capabilities are our sharpest tools to succeed in communication, we have to think about what's the job I need to do and, and how do I need to reach this person? And sending an email or a text may not do it because there's such room, uh, there, there's such room for um, this information. Mm. I love what you said there regarding the advice to just pick up the phone. I myself have uh, heard that uh, from leaders and I've shared that same coaching and, and uh, to members of my team with the same kind of results. You know, maybe I'm old fashioned, uh, but I do enjoy, as much as I enjoy emails and text messages because it's quick and easy, there's nothing like a good old fashioned phone call or face-to-face -face conversation mm -hmm. to help clear up any potential misunderstandings. Uh, Cause yes, um, Oftentimes, electronic information, things get lost in translation and the wrong intentions could be understood. And in fact, I think that's one of the reasons they invented emojis to help uh, the writers uh, convey the emotions that they were uh, intending in, uh, in their communication. Uh, how do you feel about the use of emojis in, in the workplace and professional communication? Do you think there's a place for them or maybe not so much? Perhaps, um, and I come to it from my own background, and maybe this is an example of you know older people not branching out into something uh, new. But as a broadcast journalism and English major, so uh, proper grammar and and syntax and everything is is still really important to me. With that said, it is a form of communication, and so we. I would use them sparingly. I would again look at your organizational culture. Are they accepted? You know, I mean, if, if you're in a law firm, you're probably not going to be using emojis. But if you're in a app development or a creative services uh, entertainment company and you're new and a lot of young employees, yeah, it's it's going to be fine. I would just say, you know, know the culture in which your your organization operates in, mm -hmm. and think about this. Your Electronic communication is permanent, no matter how many steps you take to delete it. It can be found if somebody really wants that. So mm -hmm. think about, is that a communication that you want on your permanent record to, uh, to mm -hmm. define you? And, you know, we all make mistakes. I'm not saying, oh, we got to be perfect on this. No, well, we can't. You know, we're, we're not in a perfect world. Um, perfection isn't of this planet, but excellence is. So try to be excellent and find out, is that you know, something that I really want attached to me a mm -hmm. couple months, even a couple of years down the line. Right. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, <clears throat> one last question I wanted to ask you is, uh, again, the, the subject of emojis made me think about the different communication styles uh, uh, with the different generations in the workforce now. Obviously, um, you know, I grew up before the internet, you know, um, I was mostly phone calls and uh, actual handwritten letters that went in the mailbox. And obviously um, <clears throat> we have uh, millennials in the workplace that uh, grew up you know, on their phones or tablets and communicate much differently. So can you talk at all about, from a leadership perspective, how can leaders help maybe bridge that generational gap when it comes to communicating so they can be more effective leaders? Yeah, and that's a really tough challenge because uh, you, we're also talking about Gen Z, too, that's now in the workplace, and their communication styles are are different, too, and a lot of their influences have been forged by the COVID lockdowns, and there isn't as much socialization instruction, if you will, yeah. and so it really, and then that made everybody locked down, so it's really hard for them to uh, to communicate in in a lot of ways. And it really becomes a, uh, an issue of the older generation having their particular communication styles, the, the other the younger generations having theirs, and really meeting up and saying, okay, what's appropriate for the needs of this mm -hmm. uh, organization? And, you know, then how are you going to best react to the message? So it becomes two things. As an employee, this is what I need to convey for the image of our organization and to get the um, 
to put us in the best light and to get our stakeholders what they need. But then in terms of intra-organizational communications, like who is going to respond to what? I mean, there, there have been issues that I've seen where people don't respond to emails. It's like, oh, sorry, I, I just respond to Texas and, and people don't know that. So there has to be an understanding like, okay, I will try my best to text you, but you got to check your email too. You know, let's meet somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Uh, indeed. Um, I did have one last question I wanted to ask you. Something you said reminded me. Um, you know, what's your thoughts regarding, I know there's been a lot of talk recently regarding the value of higher education, even going to college at all mm -hmm. for undergrad, based on the fact that, you know, information is available on, on, online for free to anyone. You know who needs to go and get a degree now the world's changed i know that i enjoyed my experience even having um, not gotten my master's until recently and I, I wouldn't trade it for the world i thought it was a wonderful experience but i'm just curious what's your thoughts on on that kind of talk and from where you stand as a professor at the, both ucla and Pepperdine? oh yeah you're you're uh, you're asking me to touch the third rail of uh higher yeah. education okay i'll do it um and use my own personal Thoughts. I still believe there's value in higher education, but I believe that we have to change a little bit of what we've been doing. You know, there's the big issue of student loan uh, repayment and ballooning student loan debt. And, you know, look, I am a big believer of, you know, owning your personal responsibilities if you've taken a loan out. However, there is some misinformation uh, out there. People don't realize that that interest rate, that the meter starts running the first moment they step into a class. And a lot of people don't know that and they haven't been told that. And so in my mind, it also becomes like a predatory uh, mm -hmm. way in which uh, people are getting money and they, they have this outstanding debt and they're wondering how they're going to pay it off. So I think we need to look at that on a government basis saying, you know, what is a real, you know, legitimate type of loan, uh, you know, interest rate. Uh, for me, if it was, I mean, heck, if I'm going to touch the third rail, I'm going all the way. Uh, if I had the control, what I'd say is you still owe your student debt, but we're going to wipe out the interest that that debt accrued because it's a different mindset now. And I think that's a fair way in the middle. I also think that, you know, we need to look at the practicality of things. Folks are going to have to look at how do we make people better at what they do? And I'm speaking from a business person's perspective. I get that. I'm not an arts person, um, humanities person, even though my undergraduate major f uh, fit in that category. People want to know, will this help me? And I think we have to be honest about looking at where do the where does the future of uh, higher education exist given the future of what the marketplace needs? I mean, I think we need to be focusing a lot more on cybersecurity degrees and, and instruction and other things that people can can use uh, and will be very, uh, very valuable. I, I think in a lot of ways, we've somewhat sold students a bill of goods like oh well just follow your passion if this is what you want to major and follow it well are there any jobs in that major other than teaching there has to be a reality aspect of uh of that mm -hmm. uh, and it's also been societally oh you're you're nothing if you don't have a college degree well you know what that's not true there's a lot of people that do a lot of good for society without their their college uh, degrees you know you look at people that learn how to be plumbers electricians things like that when the chips are down and you need them, you need them. They provide a vital service. And you can make a really good yeah. at that. And if that's something you love to do, then you should do it. So I think there is still, yes, a future for higher education. Um, socially, it was one of my best experiences in life uh, ever. And I had learned things that I needed to learn for my business. But I think we really need to look at the changing landscape of it in terms of how are people going to make money? Um, how is the student loan process providing a service or a disservice? And let's not be judgmental about this. Let's be practical. If if you want to uh, work as a lineman in an electrician, by all means, go for it. The no job is better than 
than uh, the others. So I think there needs to be a societal shift and I think a more practical application of higher education, but and a reworking of the student loan process. But yes, I think it's a vitally important segment of our population. And we just like anything need to look at how is the landscape changing and how did we need to how do we need to meet those changes? Agreed. I'm with you there. I think uh, if anything, there's a place for it. Uh, just like with anything, it needs to evolve based on the time mm -hmm. uh, to stay mm -hmm. relevant and add value ultimately for us, uh, for students. So Professor, this has been wonderful. I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I want to be respectful of your time because I know that you're busy. How should listeners get a hold of you if, you, of you, if they want to learn more? Okay, um, if they want to learn more, uh, they can um, email me at my uh, my Pepperdine email, uh, thomas.mccluskey at pepperdine.edu. Uh, and I will, uh, I will respond. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And you're, you're on LinkedIn as well, of yes. course. Thank you. Yes, I'm on LinkedIn under Tom McCluskey, and you can see me there and message me there. That's probably better than than the email. Find me on LinkedIn. Uh, thanks for thanks for the lead. Uh, that that's exactly the first place to go. Message me on LinkedIn. I'll get back to you, and I look forward to hearing from you. Wonderful. I'll make sure I include links uh, on the uh, in the comments section. Right. So, Professor, thank you again. This has been wonderful. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Antoine. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, hey, my dogs uh, enjoyed the opportunity to contribute as well. Oh, great. I love it. <laughs> Thanks, Professor. Thanks, Antoine. Appreciate your time.